So uh, good morning. How is everybody doing? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, very good. Excellent. So uh, welcome to the Public Sector Summit. I uh, have the first session, so uh, I like to think of it as the keynote, the keynote session. Uh, but I guess that's a little bit later on today. So, um, so first off, this is a, uh, a great session. I love it. I, not only do I love the content, but I love the challenge of it. There's so much to talk about. We have over 90 services. Uh, we have about 45, 50 minutes or so. Um, so it'll be really tough. We have a lot to cover. I'm actually lobbying to have it an eight hour session next year. Uh, so that, that'll be awesome for, for people to sit through that. But uh, we have a, a lot of content, so, uh, so let's go ahead and get started, right? So um, I don't know if, uh, if you've had a chance to read the book, The Big Switch by Nicholas Carr, but I would really recommend uh, having a read. It's, it's really great. It talks about the transformation from electricity to, to cloud computing. And uh, it's, it's just a really great, a really great read. And in it, he tells the story of Henry Burden. And you can barely make him out down there on the lower left-hand side. In 1851, Henry Burden uh, came to New York and he started Burden Iron Works. And uh, this was a, a massive iron working factory. And he won some major contracts with the federal government. They uh, created um, uh, railroad spikes and horseshoes, and, and he was just, just crushing it, right? But to power his factory, he had built the Burden Water Wheel. It's the largest vertical water wheel in history. It's like 62 feet tall, 20 feet wide. Uh, but he used that to generate electricity for his factories. And he was doing really, really well in the industry until this man came along. Right? Who is this? Right, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison came up with a way to more effectively and cheaper disseminate electricity. And it transformed people's lives. It transformed businesses Businesses, originally in their business plan, they would have a whole section that talked about how they're going to build a water wheel to generate electricity for their plants. That whole thing went away, and now they could focus on what was important to them, what they were, what they were manufacturing or building. So, we are in another transformational moment in history where we no longer have to build data centers to power whatever it is that we're building. And you're gonna hear a lot over the next couple days, but when you really peel back all the covers of whatever that topic is, it's always going to be at the core, AWS is about making it easy to consume the undifferentiated heavy lifting. And think about that for a moment. There's all these things that you need to do if you're in IT, if you're serving IT. You gotta have compute, storage, networking, databases, security that everybody has to do. And the thing is, is that it's really hard to get it right. And then if you do get it right, it's only right for a short period of time because the next version of the OS comes out. Now you gotta patch it. The next version of your database comes out. You gotta install it. Then you gotta update it. You run out of disk space. You gotta add new hard drives to it. Something breaks, you have to put in a new NIC card. And on and on and on and on it goes. So this is all undifferentiated heavy lifting. Why are you spending money on that? Because it doesn't give you a competitive advantage. Think about it. If you build a mobile app, the fact that, that mobile app can send out a, an alert or a notice and it pops up, so does everybody else's app, right? 
that, that's not a competitive advantage. Why build out a whole infrastructure that does notifications, for instance? For existence? So this whole thing about all these common services that doesn't differentiate you from, what, from, from your competitors, why put resources into it? So that's, at the end of the day, that's what AWS is all about, is providing services and solving that undifferentiated heavy lifting. So what I've done, we're gonna go over the platform and I've broken it into two categories. There's the infrastructure side and then there's the software side and we'll cover both. Sound good? Very good, all right, so onto the physical platform. So this is our global regional network. We currently have 16 regions around the world, 19 coming soon. You'll hear more about this slide later on today and, uh, and tomorrow. But a region is just a geographical location around the world where we have many, many, many data centers. So think of a region as like Northern Virginia or Oregon, right? And this is really important because we do it completely different than others in the industry. And I'll spend more time on what these look like a little later on. But on top of that, we have 68 global points of presence. These are edge locations where we have storage and serverless compute. There's automatic DDoS protection, denial of service protection built in at these edge locations. There's intelligent DNS routing, but it's all about pushing content and compute out to people, the closest, you know, to people that's, that's consuming that. But these are all connected together on a 100% Amazon controlled network. So if you have content that's going from one region to another region, it's flowing on that network. So very, very important, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. In a lot of cases, we're actually running our own undersea network cable. This is pretty cool. This is a, um, uh, a Hawaii uh, cable line that spans over 14,000 kilometers. It connects up Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, and Oregon all together. Uh, very, fa very fascinating. Um, I actually have a video of a, of a shark that's biting uh, uh, actually, a competitor's cable, so I didn't want to show it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's pretty cool. So that's a lot of armor that goes around that. Um, th what you're seeing right here is a repeater. You've got to have a repeater every 60 to 80 kilometers. You've got to run power to it. It's, it. it's quite a challenge. But inside that big, massive uh, cable there, there's three strands of fiber. Three strands of fiber, right? That's, that's massive. Um, in a lot of cases, you would run a, um, a protocol like CWDM or, or, or DWDM going across that. That's dense wave division multiplexing. Um, who, who knows what that is? Right, exactly, right? But so if you're ever at a, at a dinner party or a cocktail party, because IT people go to cocktail parties all the time, just throw out DWDM and you, you'll look amazing. Um, but no. But seriously, that's dense wave division multiplexing. And if you remember back from, I don't know, seventh grade science class, white light is made up of all the other colors of the wavelength. So white light, like those really bright lights, um, have red and blue and green, so on and so forth. So what we'll do is we'll divide that up into wavelengths so you your Facebook update will be running over the blue. Your Twitter will be running over red. Your whatever, your streaming video will be running over green. So in that same white light, we'll all have a piece of that wavelength as we communicate. So we actually have 100 <laughs> waves running at 100 gigabit over that one cable. It's amazing. It's about a 30 terabit cable. And we have many, many, many cables spread out. It's, it's all redundant. Back to that beautiful slide. It's all redundant network connections. So if one goes down, we'll fail over to the next. Um, so, so pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, so let's drill into one of those regions, right? So if we, we zoom into a region uh, really, really close, again, this is a, um, a place 
um, you know, on the planet where we have a set of data centers. And what we'll do is we'll take this geographical location and we carve it up into what we call availability zones. And an availability zone um, is on its own separate floodplain. It has its own separate internet connections, network connections, as well as power. So if anything happens to an AZ, an availability zone, it won't affect the other ones. Um, even though I spent about eight hours in, in PowerPoint building this out, um, it's an actual representation of a region. This is one of our larger regions. This is actually in Northern Virginia where we have five AZs with inside this region. All regions have two or more. Um, new regions that we're building out now will all have about three. Uh, three is mathematically the right number to have. If you wanna have a great read to your spouse, uh, read the Paxos theory. Uh, theorem um, you know, on, on Wikipedia. It, it's great. It explains why three is such a great number. Um, but to put this into perspective, an AZ will have one or more facilities in it. Sometimes they'll have as many as eight facilities. And there's many, many AZs that have about over 300,000 servers in that one AZ. That's just an AZ, right? So just absolutely massive numbers. Um, but, you know, all this connects out to the internet, of course. We have redundant transient centers. So all internet connectivity and connectivity to other regions go through a transient center. So one thing I thought would be really fun to show. This, very cool by the way, we are one of the first companies in the industry to, to, to run this. This is a 3456F cable. This is the actual cable that we run that connects up AZs and data centers together. This is amazing. It has 3,456 individual strands of fiber, which is a strand of glass, right, all within this. Um, there's a, uh, you can see it, there's a really strong, stru uh, structurally strong um, core in it so that we can pull it through the data centers through these two-inch conduit pipes. Um, but, but really amazing, you should come up and, and check it out after the uh, after this session. These things are about, they're, they're about as thick as my cat's whisker. They, they're amazingly thin, and it's a, a thing of glass. Again, you would run like DWDM through this, right, on all these individual strands of fiber. So come check it out afterwards. This is really, really amazing. Um, so uh, pr pretty cool stuff from a technical perspective. But why is all this important? Two reasons. From a region perspective, it's important because when you deploy a website, or you deploy an application from a drop-down box, you have the ability to deploy that to multiple facilities across separate regions. I'm sorry, separate uh, AZs. So if an AZ goes down, we'll automatically route traffic to a whole nother bank of data centers where your application is running. When you store a file in our object storage, it's going to be dispersed up to 16 times across many facilities, many AZs within a region. So that's why, uh, no, the first reason why it's really important. The second reason why the global network is important is because of elephants. Specifically cute baby elephants, right? But, but no, in, uh, in complete seriousness, on uh, 2012, World Elephant Day was founded by Patricia Sims. She had this idea to save the endangered African and Asian elephants. Very true, very sad story. 
if things continue with the way they are with poaching and uh, territorial conflict, we'll have no living elephants in the wild in the next 20 to 30 years. It's a staggering fact. So she had this idea to save the African elephants. 2012, August 12th, 2012, it was launched. Became really, really popular. This is a big deal. Uh, William Shatner did a video, um, and, and it you know, grew and grew and grew. In 2015, it was so popular that on their World Elephant Day, everyone hit that server, and it crashed. And for the majority of the one day a year when they bring in a massive amount of their funds to save the African elephants, their servers were down. And I remember the conversation specifically. Patricia had called us up, and uh, she was talking. She's like, you know, we, uh, you know, we were down. We, were, we weren't able to raise any money or a lot of money on our World Elephant Day. We would like to migrate to AWS. Can you help us out? But we have two big concerns. One, we need to scale globally. And then two, we're a nonprofit. We don't have much money. So what would that look like on AWS? And, uh, and I just remember thinking, man, you know, it was really sad, but you know, like on my way home, I got so excited because we could do this. <laughs> and I remember thinking, it's like, dude, if you're an elephant, I'm going to hook you up. So the next day, you know, we all came in, we all got together, and we, we started building this out. This took us you know, a quick, quick amount of time. But we stood up the servers running across multiple AZs. With a click of a button and a little configuration change, we pushed out that website to the global network. And now, fun, fun, fun fact, on August 12th, as all the uh, donation campaigns were running around the world, they were being redirected to the servers that were closest to them. Fun fact, the origin servers, the ones that are in charge of making sure the data all goes out to all the edge locations, that origin server, from a CPU network and disk I.O. perspective, was about 4% utilized. It was sitting there idle, but yet we were getting way more traffic than we had the year before. The beauty is, after it was all over with, shrunk it back down to a more manageable size for a nonprofit, and then are off and running. So the beautiful thing that I like about this is that it's a really small nonprofit having meaningful impact on a global basis, all but just because of an idea that, that somebody had. So really, really cool story that um, I think kind of shows off the, the, the beauty of the network. So, uh, so with that said, uh, let's, let's switch over. We're going to switch gears now from the physical network, and we'll talk about um, the, the, the platform. So I'm a Mac guy, so I've got to figure this all out. So, when you log in to, to the console, you log in, you can create a free account, you can log in. You'll see it be the upper right hand side. You can have access to all the regions that, uh, that, that you can access. Here we're working with the Northern Virginia region. But, so everything you would do, you'd be working in the Northern Virginia region. If you are just getting started, I love this section down here at the bottom, this learn to build. So if you have a workload like a website, DevOps, backup and recovery, mobile, databases, you can click on this backup and or, or, or this, this workload here, and it up pops this page where there's these project guides, labs and tutorials that you can log in and take a self-paced lab to learn all this uh, technologies that make up this particular workload which jumps into all the commonly used services. There's videos and webinars that you can, there's all the white papers. There's the SDKs if you want to drop to that level. But it's a really, really great way to get started. And there's a whole bunch of them. So I would highly encourage you, if you haven't logged into the console or played around with it very much, to check out these learn to build uh, sections. 
Then there's also build a solution, which has simple wizards and workflows to build a web app, to stand up a static website, to register a domain. So if you needed to port your URL to, to AWS, there's um, a quick uh, three-step process to go through that. Um, the next thing I would point you to is um, coincidentally, if you click on the all services link, it lists all the services. Uh, so underneath that, it's broken into categories. So there's compute. And this, it, it spans the whole range from I just want to stand up a virtual machine that you have complete control over. You can install whatever you want to on it. You can configure it to however you like. Or maybe you just want to stand up a set of virtual machines, but you don't have to worry about spreading it out across AZs and dealing with load balancing and failover. You don't have to worry about patching. You set up a window that would say how often that server is patched before it rolls over to the next server and then patches it. You can specify at what level you want patches done. So there's that in-between phase. Maybe you don't even want that. Maybe you just want to write code in Java or Python or C Sharp and upload it to the cloud and say, run it. I don't care about servers. I don't care about the OS. I just want you to throw whatever resources that are needed to keep up with the load that you're going to get. And I'm going to pay every time my function gets executed. So maybe it's every 100 milliseconds you get charged a fraction of a penny, right? So the point is you have that complete control over a virtual machine, or do I want to go to the complete opposite end and I just want to say, hey, just run this in the cloud and take care of everything, right? So that's all underneath that compute section. From a storage, same thing. Maybe you just want to have, you want to have virtually unlimited storage in the cloud, so you just throw files at it, or you can have high-performance SSD drives that you raid together and attach it to a virtual machine, or maybe it's cold storage that you need. Well, I'm going to put up archival data, and I don't need it for three or five hours or so. Just store that. So again, you have that full, complete gamut of what your entry point is into compute, into storage, into networking, into security, on and on and on. Databases, the same thing. So you can either have a fully managed relational or non-relational database or a data warehouse like Hadoop or what have you. So a complete set of, of options from a database perspective. The same thing with network, and, uh, uh, network delivery. Um, you know, this is the stuff we use for, for the elephants down here at the bottom. And then, of course, everything to manage it um, across the top. So this allows you to log everything. Let's say for compliancy, you want to log everything, everything, everything that happens in your virtual private cloud and then report on it. Set alerts so that you get a notification when something unique happens on your virtual machine. You can do all that with the management tools. Um, but then you know, maybe all the way at the other end of the spectrum, you just want to consume document collaboration and email or maybe a desktop stream to you over the web, right? So it's that complete gamut. So if you, if you realize, if you look closely what's happening, this is to one degree or another, all IT resources that everybody needs, right? It's that undifferentiated heavy lifting that is just taken care of, right? You know, why spend a three or a five year long contract on something, especially I like to think about business a lot, <laughs> so especially in, in economic and, and business uncertainty times. We have no idea what the business world is going to look like in three years, five years out. Why have a contract that's going to lock you into something when you don't know what the business is going to look like? Why not pay for it, turn it off when you don't need it anymore, right? That's all about this service being delivered. When you turn it on when you need it, you turn it off when you don't need it, right? So, so a big, you know, again, a heavy... Heavy theme there.
you know what? I, I wasn't going to talk about this. Um, I didn't know if we'd have enough time, but you know what? It's, this is important. <laughs> Let me think about this. When you look at business, right? It, you look at business over time, there's a lot of really, really smart people out there that are saying that we are entering into a new era of business. Think about it. In the 1700s, you had the colonial period. 1800s, the Industrial Revolution. The mid-1900s, the marketing era. Well, about 10 years ago, people have started to notice that we're entering in a new era, and it's been dubbed the relationship era. And this is all because, again, really, really smart people have identified that it's easier and more cost-effective to have a really good relationship with a customer over the long haul they spend more money, they're more loyal to you than it costs to acquire a new customer. Right. I, could, I could talk for hours just on that. It's deep. It's a deep, deep, deep topic. But this is all about the relationship era. What are the three things that you need if you're a business, an organization, or a nonprofit, or what have you? What are the three things that you need? You need great employees. You need a product or a service. And then you need customers, right? These are the three fundamental things that you need to do something, right? So having said that, that's an undifferentiated heavy lifting that you need with customers. And that's what Amazon Connect is all about is that it's an on-demand customer relationship management service that you can consume when you need, turn it off when you don't, only pay for what you get. A lot of people will ask me, well, what's all Amazon Connect about? That's what it's about. This is an undifferent, we all need to have a great relationship with our customers. Everybody needs this. Why spend multi-million dollar infrastructure to build that out? Why build it out yourself, right? Why not consume that as a service? So just another really, really great example of this undifferentiated heavy lifting that we all need that you can consume as a service. So, so this is really, really great stuff there. So um, let's, uh, let, let's switch back over. Another really great solution that's been built out on the platform are my friends at White House Historical Association. And I'm actually really proud, happy to see y'all in, in the audience today. So thanks for being here. They have built out an amazing solution that, that I'd like to tell you about. So, uh, so you know, Stephanie, Lauren, Leslie, Alexandra, you know, thanks for, for all that y'all are doing. So their job is to um, preserve, in my opinion, at a very high level, to preserve the history of the White House. And they had this idea of how to do that. And so they have all these filing, you should check it out. There's filing cabinets on filing cabinets of all these photos. And if you look really closely, I mean, there's Monroe, there's Abraham Lincoln, there's uh, the Kennedys. There, there's thousands upon thousands of these images in these filing cabinets, as well as in freezers. There's these beautiful, beautiful wooden boxes full of all these glass negatives that's all very, very sensitive. And it's just sitting down there, and, and it's vulnerable, right? What happens if something happens to the building, or it, it floods, or something goes wrong with the freezers, or, or what have you, right? This living history would be lost forever. And I, I remember I was, uh, I was sitting in, in the office, and um, I was talking to Stephanie and Lauren, and I had asked, okay, so we want to digitize this. What's, 
the goal? What is it that you want to accomplish with this? And I was thinking, oh, they're going to put it behind a paywall. They have this scheme where they're going to now sell this to other people that would like to access all this stuff. And Lauren, I remember, I love it. It was beautiful. Lauren says, it's about two things. It's about preservation and it's about access. I love that. They are wanting to preserve the living history of the White House for future generations to enjoy. And then they want to make it accessible to everybody around the world. And I think that's beautiful. I love it. It's an it's a amazing idea. So we ordered a snowball device. This is something that you can order from the console. You log into the console. You say, give me a snowball device. It shows up a couple days later. You load your images to it. So we scanned thousands upon thousands of images. And this is just the first batch. But we scanned them onto a snowball device. It's hardened. It's encrypted. It's, you, know, you can shake it really, really hard. It, but anyway, you can throw it. You can see it's been kind of knocked around. I think people want to try to test it out. I'm not sure about that. But you take this device and you ship it to a region. You plug it in, load it up to your storage that you define, and then those images are available, in this case, to do with whatever you want. So in this case, we loaded it into their database, which is running on some virtual machines, and now people can access these thousands and thousands of images. So future generations can now enjoy um, all this content uh, that's out there. So I, I think it's just, uh, an absolutely amazing story. So from my heart, honestly, thank you all for what you're doing down there. It's, it matters, right? It, it's, it's a great idea and it matters um, to, to future generations. So, so thank you. Just another great example of a really easy way to take content that's locally and put it up you know, in, in the cloud. So let's, uh, let, let's swap over uh, once again. Um, one question that I hear all the time is, you know what? That's good and great. I love it. I have two questions. <clears throat> how much is it going to cost? And then how do I get started? Right? So on that first question, um, I, would, I would make this a note. There's something called the simple monthly calculator. So you can use your, your favorite search engine and type in simple monthly calculator and, and this will come up. But it lists all of our major services that you can go through. So you can specify you know, how many compute servers you would want, you know, how much storage that you would want, um, and then what class of storage that you would want. And then it will build out um, an estimate of what your monthly cost would be. And a good um, a good reason why there's so much to it is because all those images that the White House Historical Association has uploaded is maybe there's certain images that are really, really popular. So we'd like to have that on a high performance disk. But maybe certain images maybe might not be so popular. So wouldn't it be cool if we could look at that and then take the images that aren't so popular and then put them on a lower class of storage. It's still highly redundant, still available, still durable, but it's on a lower class disk. And maybe there's an image that hasn't been accessed in, I don't know, you know, 10 years or so. How about taking that and moving it off to uh, an offline storage, maybe archive it, right? So saving them money. So all this is done automatically. You can apply these, these policies to it. And there's all these other services that you can leverage just in that one space. One thing I would like to talk to them about is now using something like recognition, which will automatically look at an image and do automatic tagging. So I think about this with the historians. So again, more, uh, I'll tell you that story afterwards, but they have these really, really smart historians that concentrate on certain areas. Maybe you have somebody who's really good in architecture somebody who's really good in artifacts or paintings or people. Wouldn't it be awesome to look at all these, again, 
thousands upon tens of thousands of images and tag it to say, hey, this is a building. Well, put it in John's queue so he can go in there and add more metadata about it. Or maybe this one has a, a vase in it or a boss. Go ahead and tag that and send that to this historian to get more information on it. So all those various services just around storage, you can price it out and get an idea of what it will look like. Of course, you'll get billed based on what you actually use. So this is, uh, this is an estimate. The, the other thing I would mention is the quick starts. These are amazing. I love them and I use them all the time. So imagine if you need to stand up um, a DevOps environment or maybe database and storage or you have an idea to do big data and analytics or for public sector, maybe you need to stand up an environment that supports NIST, the DOD certs and the FedRAMP standards. But you don't know how to do it, right? It's complex. You can click on learn more and up pops a diagram of what a blank environment would look like. So it has all the config rules, it has all the necessary logging, the alarm set up. It creates virtual networks that are locked down with the appropriate firewall rules and settings of the virtual machines that conform, you can see up here, to the NIST 853 and 871, to the, to the FISMA and the FedRAMP standards, to the cloud computing SRG. It's an environment that conforms to all that. And then here's the beauty. I can come up here at the top and say, deploy now. And look at that. And what's, now it's gonna start. You can see up on the upper left-hand side, there's four steps to this. It's gonna wanna know, hey, what's the size of my template? It's gonna ask me some additional details if I wanted it. But then I can hit go, and in about you know, seven to 10 minutes, that complete architecture that's blank is stood up for me. So now I can load whatever servers and apps I want into it, and it's already NIST 853, 171, blah, 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 compliant. So it's a really great way to stand something up, see if it meets your needs, and if it doesn't, you hit delete, and you turn it off, right? And you're not paying for it anymore. And there's all these services that are up there, right? So this is just the, um, the, 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 the NIST stuff. Again, uh, databases, SharePoint, Exchange, SQL Server, networking environments, right? There's additional quick starts at the bottom. So there's all these workloads that are templated out. Everything, 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 everything inside AWS is driven by an API or a CLI. It's infrastructure as code. This environment, all these environments here, or templated it out, you can just take that template and then run it and it spins up your environment and then you can do whatever you want to with it. So it's a really, really great way to get started with a ton of different workloads, <clears throat> regardless of what it is, and you don't have to know all the details. Stand it up, learn from it, and then take it and, and then run with it, or shut it down and build you know, off of that if you need be. So a really, really great way to, uh, to get started. So I would, I would definitely look at those, those two, two options. Price everything out. Um, it'll be an estimate because you get charged on based on what you use. And then look at those templates that will, will get you started with a whole ton of different workloads. <clears throat> so with that said, I want to leave you with, uh, with, with one last thing. I have the pleasure pleasure and the honor to work with public sector customers every day. And I love it. I'm constantly just blown away by your ideas and the passions that you have in your respective domains. I love it. I get to see a lot of different stuff. And a lot of people will come up and they'll, they'll tell me their ideas, and, and I love it. You know, I love hearing about people's ideas. And you all have amazing ideas. I hear them all the time.
but I also hear that people think that, well, maybe their idea won't save the elephants of the world or preserve living history for future generations. But I would argue that even those ideas started with just a, a small thought, right? And now that there's never been a better time to just go for it, right? To just give it a go. That's the beauty of this whole cloud computing thing, is that you have access to the same resources as multi-billion dollar companies, some of those most powerful governmental institutions on the planet. All that power is at your fingertips with inside the console and the command line. <clears throat> whether you're in a dorm room or whether in your basement or whether you're back at your office, if you have an idea, I would just say, give it a go. If it turns out to not work, you can just turn it off and, and no one knows about it. Right? But if it turns into something, then you can take it and, and run with it. And that's what, that's what this cloud computing, that's what this platform is all about. No matter what it is your idea, there's a free service tier available on a lot of it. <clears throat> so you can just stand it up and give it a go. You know, I have a, a personal policy that I'm not going to be 80 or 90 years old and wonder what if, what could have been. I would rather build something out and it fail or not work out, but I know than to live the rest of my life wondering what if, right? <clears throat> so that's the beauty of the platform, <clears throat> is it gives you access to an unlimited set of resources to build out whatever your ideas have. So with that, I would just say give it a go, right? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <clears throat> So, uh, so just uh, for the respect of the next presenter, we'll take Q&A down here um, on, on the side and, uh, and come check out the cable. Cool stuff. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.